Transitioning from QuickBooks desktop to the cloud is a challenge many organizations are navigating today. This shift is not just about moving from the past to a new and improved future. It's also about unlocking greater efficiency and endless possibilities. My colleague Lynn Larson is currently assisting a not-for-profit through this transition, and we are fortunate enough to have QuickBooks expert Beth Carter here to share her valuable insights. Before Lynn dives into her detailed questions, I'd like to start off by asking Beth about the most common pitfalls organizations encounter when making this transition. Oh boy, well hello Mary, and hello Lynn. I would say in terms of the transition, uh, one of the misconceptions is that they are so different that they're basically two different softwares. That is, an, that is a misconception, even though it feels that way. And I get it. I've been there. I, I was that person as well who learned bookkeeping on desktop. Um, it feels like it's two different systems. But when you actually understand the why behind what you're doing, it's the same thing. So what you're, you know, a lot of people have been taught to do bookkeeping, and I use air quotes there, um, as a data entry role. Um, and that's number one, whether you're using desktop or you're using uh, online, is you're only going to go so far as a quote bookkeeper or person doing the books if you only know how to do data entry. You need to understand accounting theory and you need to understand the why behind each one of those data strokes or one of those keystrokes. So so if you have that understanding, that knowledge, then you can easily transition from one to the other because you know what your goal is. I'm trying to get it to be here. So what buttons do I need to press to get there? Uh, one of the things I tell people a lot, um, another, I guess, misconception, not necessarily about the um, transition, but about bookkeeping, um, because uh, I teach bookkeeping um, as well and have for many years. Um, People think it's about math. People say, I'm not a numbers person, or I was really terrible in math, you know, growing up. And I say, um, bookkeeping has little to, to no, um, you know, correlation with math. The technology is doing the math for you. You need to know the accounting theory and the technology. That's what people who are doing books need to know. So the ability to sort of just understand the why you're doing what you're doing will allow you to then manipulate the technology to get from point A to point B. And, and by the way, the, the misconception that you named, Beth, um, I had that misconception. So I'm glad you're calling it out from the beginning. So Lynn, I love that you said had, questions. by the way. I had, yeah. <laughs> Lynn, you have some questions. Um, so Beth, let me start with, with one thing that to me was really different from desktop, at least in terms of what the organization I'm working with was doing. Uh, when you start looking at your transaction, would you say it would be a best practice to import bank transactions, whether you're doing it quasi manually through a designated file that you're getting from the bank or whether you're connecting them so transactions are happening automatically? So would you say you should do that? And I'm going to give you the multi, multi part question here. Like what about not importing transactions at all and simply going to the bank register in QuickBooks? My heart, and marking... hurts. My heart hurts, Lynn. I, well, but the, you know, this is, this is what the organization had been doing. Just, you know, marking things off as, as reconciled, you know, right in the register. So that's going to lead to even more questions, but that would be a good starting point, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's fun. Okay, let me let me think of where to start the answer. Um, the I would say the amount of people who were pulling in the bank feed to QuickBooks Desktop and the amount of people that were manually entering are pretty pretty even, right? Okay. Um, so, and that's as far as desktop is concerned. Because okay. if you've ever dealt with the bank feed in desktop, it is brutal. It is terrible. It is. It's just, it's not user friendly. It, it, it wasn't made for that, you know? So the bank feed in online is phenomenal. Life-changing, like time-saving, sort of anything that you can think of. Um, whether or not you connect it directly to the bank or monthly um, CSV or QBO state, um, you know, statement um, and put it in. I mean, first of all, if you if your bank will connect to QuickBooks, I want to 
million percent suggest just connecting it to QuickBook. Okay. Um, that way you don't have to wait until the end of the month to do anything, right? And depending on the size of the organization, sometimes you can't wait an entire month to start, you know, adding bank fee item. Um, you used the word automatic and I cringed a little bit. Uh, there is a, a beautiful piece of QuickBooks Online um, in the bank feed, which I believe now is just called Bank Transactions. Correct. Um, called Rules. So you can create rules that can actually be pretty, um, pretty detailed. And sometimes you want them to be more generic. So we'll kind of get into that in a moment. But the beauty of these rules is that you don't have to remember or go back and look in the vendor center to say, oh, what did I, you know, what was this vendor coded to last time? So the problem comes when people click that little button at the bottom that says automatically apply rule. No, I love technology. I love AI. I love all things that make things better and easier and faster and more accurate, but accuracy being the key word there. So, um, let's let me give you an example let's say um acme um acme cable is the name of your cable your internet provider um so you create a rule that says anytime you see the word acme you're going to code that to internet expense and then months later you um you get you know a, a let's say oil delivery and to your office and it's from acme oil well if you're set to automatic rule and that that's going to be a major difference right you're talking like 30 dollars versus like a 300 dollars charge it's just it's going to take whichever one comes first in your rule so even if you created a rule that said acme oil equals utilities it doesn't care because the first rule said just the word acme so it can be very complicated and until you really understand it you know it 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 will take some time, which is even more so why you should never use the automatically add because you don't know what you're getting into. But there are some really great things you can do with the bank feeds, such as, uh, or with the rules, such as setting amounts. So, for example, in my own books, I have a rule that says anytime you see Apple and it's under $10, then it's software. If you see Apple and it is more than $10, then it is office supply. Um, so, you know, you can get a little more detailed in that. You can do things like for companies that have a company vehicle and get fuel. I don't put a vendor in for every single gas station on the planet. I use one vendor called gas station, but how do I tell my bank feed that the way that I want to see that I can create a multi-layer rule that says anytime you see the word Exxon or mobile or right. And you can do up to five ors, then you're going to code it to, you know, to fuel. Um, that is something that desktop didn't have. And so if you're not using that, then you are wasting your time. Okay, this is good. long answer for a short question, but well, and so then I mean the the second part, you know, of what I asked is so you, I'm I'm assuming, but you can do a big no. You do want people to use the bank transactions feature, um, and yeah. not simply go into the bank register to uh, mark transactions. Correct. So the the there's two different ways that you can use a bank fee. Um, and most of us use it both ways. So one way would be to use it to create the transaction. The other way to use it would be to match it to the transaction that you manually created, right? And so most of us use it both ways, depending on what the situation is. Like for my staff, if it's a credit card, you're not entering a bill for a monthly credit card recurring transaction, right? It's just, you're creating a rule and you're saying, hey, credit card, every time you see um, the word Adobe software, it's Adobe and it's software, right? Um, but if it was a bill that I paid, then it will be a match to that. So not everything is going to be in your register by the time it comes through the bank transaction, right? So if we were doing it that way, we'd have to be in the register. We'd have to say, oh, yep, this one's here. This, oh, this one's not. All right, let me manually add that one. And it, it, it's, 
it's not a good use of your time. Um, but also when you mark off, when you manually mark reconcile, it throws things off in QuickBooks Online. So the way to reconcile is to go to the reconcile screen, which is under transactions. Right. And you would reconcile it the way that you should in desktop as well, you know, is is through the actual reconcile, um, not portal, but what word I'm looking for, um, function. function feature, um, a hundred percent of the time I would never, and I don't often say never and, and always because we know bookkeeping has a lot of gray areas. Um, but I would never click the reconcile box from the register, either on or off. Well, good. I haven't made that mistake yet. But it's okay if you have. It's not the worst thing in the world. Well, I have, <laughs> I have found that that QuickBooks Online is very forgiving. You know, mm -hmm. there are a lot of ways to undo, delete, back out, you name it, things that um, I have done. And don't uh, even get me started on other fun little tools that go along with it. That's a different podcast altogether. Well, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to move on to then. So I'm kind of in the same realm, if you don't mind, because obviously this is a big deal for or any organization, you know, dealing with the transact, they use a, primarily a cash-based uh, accounting method. Mm -hmm. And they still write a lot of checks, but I'm working with them on payment strategy too. Um, but they still write a lot of checks. And so would it be a best practice for them simply to do new and then check versus entering it as a bill? If they're on cash basis, I mean, that... that's 100% fine. Um, okay. Additionally, they could just wait for it to come through the bank feed. If you're truly oh. on cash basis, right? Which most of us who are on cash basis like to see reporting in some way on accrual basis, you know, so it's really a personal choice. Um, we, uh, in my firm, we do bookkeeping for a hundred different clients in, in different industries and in different scenarios, cash accrual, whatever. Um, and some of most of them we don't know that a check was written until it comes through the bank transaction well how did they write the check then because they, they're you how they hand wrote it oh they, see they're using the quickbooks system to create the check and so then yes if they're using quickbooks to create the check then absolutely um they can just write it as a check and and check um print later or you know right, print right now yeah, okay no need to do no need to enter a bill um unless you want to see the different dates for accrual perfect i noticed in the online version there is a built-in field called detail type and i've noticed it has auto populated and there doesn't appear to be a way turn it off <laughs> turn it all off well that's turn what i was off. wondering is it okay to ignore this field altogether so it there's a in account and settings there is an option where it says says something about remembering um transaction detail so if you go to enter a bill you're saying it brings in the, the description probably from the previous time you entered a bill for that is there any benefit to using the field and how do you turn it off then if you don't want it so, so. i want to make sure we're talking about the same thing here so i'm i'm just looking at the qbo test drive are you familiar with that lynn no okay we can have mary um post the link in the show notes but there is a a QBO test drive, which is like a sandbox um, version of QuickBooks that doesn't hold any cookies. So anyone can go in and play with it. Well, great. Right? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> yeah. There is in your settings under advanced, there is an automation section that says pre-fill forms with previously entered content. Turn that baby off. Okay. Then it will not pull information from other transactions. It will only create what's new. Um, and then if you were to create a new, uh, let's see, a new bill, for example, um, the detail, there's like the line detail or there's the description and then there's the memo. Yeah, the memo's um, fine. We're good there. But, you know, it, it, as a someone that went from desktop to online, it's just this detailed type. And I'm like, I, so I don't the care. description is what is on the transaction, but the detailed type is a part of the chart of accounts. Okay. It wants to know, like, okay, you're saying that it's a fixed asset, for example. Right. What kind of fixed asset is this? It doesn't matter. The purpose <laughs> for that detail type in the chart of accounts is for if you are doing your tax returns via your QuickBooks file. 
please don't do your tax returns via your QuickBooks file. We want a legitimate tax accountant to be doing your taxes for G&A expenses, for example. Um, I just use um, other home office ex or other, other office expenses as the detail type. It truly doesn't matter. Just choose one of them that, they, that you are allowed under the parent account. So what do you think about the receipts function? I have mixed feelings about the receipts function. Um, I think it greatly depends on the size of your organization, the situation, and the why you want to use it. So I think it's fantastic in certain situations where it makes sense. Um, what does that mean? Let's say um, you have, um, you, Lynn, are doing the books for a small nonprofit, which is, um, let's say they, let's say they're big enough to require an audit. Okay. In that audit, they're going to want to see every single receipt that they decide to put on their list. Um, if you have another great way of organizing your receipts electronically, to me, that is easier in an audit to pull as long, like I have all of my receipts, for example, year, month, day, vendor, amount. So those are all in my Dropbox. So if I ever want to go finding one, it's right there and it's easy to pull down and put in a stack for the auditor. If it's in your QuickBooks, you have to go in, you have to find the transaction, you have to download it from QuickBooks and then put it in a file to show the auditor. On the flip side, if you are doing the books and you've got people all over using the company credit card, yes, it can be absolutely easier for them to submit that receipt to QuickBooks, you see it, and then you can code it. Now, hopefully they have written on it what it's for um you know if it was a meal with a client versus a you know travel meal or or what have you um that makes it easier for an external bookkeeper unless you have another way of managing it, you know, in a Dropbox or Google Drive or, or whatever. Um, it does have OCR capabilities, which means it can read the data mm -hmm. on the receipt. But again, it's never, it's not automatic. You're still reviewing it and making sure it's similar. I know, Mary, we've talked a lot about bill.com, mm -hmm. right? It's very similar to the uploads in bill.com where it takes that information, but you still have to say, yep, this is where I want it. This is what it is. Interestingly enough, Lynn, I love the Amazon transactions feature. Hmm. So if you have um, a client who is purchasing a lot from Amazon, you want to have them upgrade to a business account if they're not already on one. Yeah, that, that's in the works. Okay, awesome. So then you're going to, in that bank transaction window, there is a, um, a section called app transactions, APP transactions. I've noticed that. You click on that and you'll see an Amazon link. That is the only one of the pictures that you see on the app transactions that I like. Please don't connect Square. Please don't connect Stripe. Amazon, however, is beautiful. So it will pull in every single transaction from your Amazon account. And what happens is you just the same as with receipts is you start there in that little, you know, module, you code it, you push it through, and then you will go to your bank transaction list and there will be a match for it. So you have to be careful that you're not duplicating information. So you want to create, you know, your own rule, not a bank rule, but your own rule that says, I always do app transactions and receipts first, and then I do the bank feed. Um, and another rule would be don't ever add anything from Amazon in the bank feed because it should always be a match. So you tell the bank feed. You just leave it. Okay. You leave it until you've done. So if you're doing your bank feeds once a week, you're going to do your Amazon transactions and your receipts first, and then you're going to have matches in your bank feed. Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, it's, it's great. Um, but I just think it's a little clunky. Um, if it's, you know, depending on the size, like if you've got a very large organization, that is a lot of receipts to have, like in a software that if you're growing is not going to necessarily grow with you. You know, if you need to go move to an ERP system at some point, you can't take those transactions with you. Remember in desktop where it would create every attachment you made would create its own little thing in a folder that lived on the desktop that the computer lived on. That doesn't happen with online. It just lives in the cloud. So there's no like centralized place where you can pull down all your receipts if you decide to leave QuickBooks. Okay. So then on the on the note of credit card transactions, you recommend having an automatic or maybe I, you don't like automatic having a um, 
seamless feed from the bank into QuickBooks. Um, yes. Okay. yes, so you'll have the bank and your credit card connected. Um, the, the thing that I see often when I'm cleaning up though is that people are taking the credit card payment and entering that as an expense with all the different line items of everything that was purchased. We need to treat a credit card as a liability. So every single transaction is going to increase that credit card liability until you make a payment and then it decreases that liability. So having it connected to the bank feed will, will do exactly that. The one thing I would say not to ever add to a bank feed um, would be a mortgage or a, lo uh, a most, lo most loan. Um, it just complicates things. Um, because you already have the payment coming out of your main checking account. And then if you have the loan account or mortgage account separate, it's going to try and connect them, which actually doesn't work. So banks, yes. Credit cards, yes. And um, lines of credit as well. Lines of credit, if you enter them in the chart of accounts as a credit card type, then it'll come through the bank feed and you can treat it as such. I'm hearing a lot of um, support or endorsement. Some of the tools that are built in, like take advantage so you're not doing so much manual work because right now everything has been manual. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this system saying there has to be a better way. So the organization are using ADP for payment payroll. Mm -hmm. And I believe they offer some type of interface that they can up, upload into QuickBooks. <laughs> and that might or be upload. It feeds directly. Oh, well, okay, then automatically, so, <laughs> automatically, we can see that, you know, payroll, because right now that is a thorn in this, the, the organization oh. side, because the transactions come through the bank feed. Yep. And then they have to be split out, you know, a couple dozen ways, I'll, I'll say that generously or Yes. you know, to all the different payroll accounts. And yeah. that is tedious. Of course. Absolutely. Oh, so right. yeah, um, ADP, paychecks, gusto, all of the uh, all of the big guys, um, they have what's called a, a, a general ledger yes. um, function. Yes, right. Um, paychecks, I believe makes you pay more for it. Gusto allows you to do it all yourself. ADP will let you do it yourself, or they have a special GL department. Um, that can help you. Um, so what happens, we'll talk about um, ADP and Gusto are very similar in that. So you create this mapping, um, you can do it by department, you can do it in multiple ways, you can do it by employee, if you want. Um, you know, of course, in a nonprofit, there's not going to be an owner. But if you're dealing with a corporation, right, and you need to have the owner's salary separated out, um, or if you wanted to have different departments, different classes, you can map it all that way. And then you you can set it to automatically, I know, I know, I said it, automatically feed in to QuickBooks as a journal entry. And then when you are in your bank feed, so you don't even have to go into ADP and press a button and say, hey, go push into QuickBooks. It just goes. And then in your bank feed, you'll just see matches. And that's it. Beautiful. If there's not a match, then there's a problem, right? You wouldn't go and try and add it yourself. You would go into ADP and say, why didn't this export the way I expected it to? Why didn't this match up? to what's in my bank transactions, you know, and, and go from there. Marvelous. And I'm sure anyone listening to this podcast is thinking, why have I been so manual all these years when this, when this bookkeeper... It's comfortable. It's, it's the way we've always done it. Well, you know what right. else? QuickBooks Online used to not be good. And a lot of people, you know, let's say over the age of 40, um, who learned QuickBooks on desktop. Back when, in, when online first came out, it was awful. It was horrible. Mm. And so a lot of us tried it back then, wrote it off and said, nope, I'm done. But I mean, it's been at least 15 years now um, that QBO has been out and it just keeps getting better and better. So this is another reason why, I don't know if Mary, any of your listeners are um, charging for their bookkeeping services or if they are employees. Um, but for those of you who are charging for services, this is why we don't do hourly. Just because something gets easier and better and faster for us doesn't mean because we've learned to adapt to technology and we've learned how to use these things to our advantage doesn't mean that we should get paid less. 
for being able to do it. Well, you know what's clear to me as I listen to this? You love QuickBooks, don't you, Beth? I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a love-hate relationship, okay? Yeah. It's a love-hate. So both of you, this is a question for both of you. Um, what advice would you give someone who is getting ready to transition to QuickBooks in the cloud or as, you know, Beth has just alluded to, somebody who maybe tried it 15 years ago, thought it stunk, but maybe now after listening to Beth, we'll give it another try. So you're both basically in a kind of the novice cloud situation. You want to go first, Lynn? Well, I'll give my answer because it, it's a little more generic. You might have some very quick book specific advice to give. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm seeing is, well, my experience with this organization, I'll use that. With the transition, there was a mindset, and you've alluded to this already, that, okay, now we're online. Great. We can do it from our home offices versus, you know, driving into the, to the organization. So let's just continue the way we've done it. Let's figure out how to stay on the, you know, the same path and, and just get things done where, you know, again, I'm pretty new to it. I'm looking and I, I could realize, you know, that there were so many um, better, automatic, better ways of doing things. And you've, you've demonstrated that today. So I would say walk into it with an open mind for change. Mm -hmm. And enhancements. Right. Absolutely. Better ways. Yes. Absolutely. And it's hard. It is hard to change. Change. Like we, there's billions of dollars have been made by people who talk about how difficult change is. Right. Like that's that. Let's be honest. It's it's tough. Um. So that brings me to my suggestion, which would be have a consultant. Don't do it on your own. Right. Um. I have made way too much money fixing QuickBooks online files that people converted themselves um, and then had issues with down the road. Um, there, I believe there is a QuickBooks service mm -hmm. um, that does the conversion. It is quite expensive um, and they, I don't, I don't think it's the best. Um, I think finding a certified pro advisor, um, whether it's them doing the, um, the transition or them checking what you've done through the transition, um, and being able to answer questions and, or train, um, as I mentioned before we started recording, I have this online class. Um, that I teach. So I think that regardless of what level of, of, of support you need, I, I do believe that you need some level of support depending on where you're at and what you're looking at. So Beth, um, I didn't ask you this before, but how many are on your team now? Oh my gosh, 13. 13. Congratulations. 13. Thank so in, you. In addition to uh, uh, Beth teaching QuickBooks online, she actually practices what she preaches with her team of 13. Yeah. Both Beth and Lynn have appeared on this show a number of times. In fact, their talks are so popular that we've compiled a quick book, QuickBooks playlist featuring Beth and her excellent advice and a P-Card uh, playlist featuring Lynn and her excellent advice about cards. Links to both have appeared on your YouTube screen and are in the description, so you can watch them right now. Contact information for both of these ladies is in the description. Good luck. 